All right, so it's very unusual to just need to return some to just need to process some JSON. I mean, it happens, but relatively unusual. And so um, the vast majority of uh, setups like this also require a database. Now, fortunately, uh, Rust is very good at that too. Um, especially if I can open the right file. There we go. Okay, so I'm using a library called SQLX, which has become pretty much the de facto standard. Um, it works very well with just about everything else. And by default, it supports um, SQLite, Postgres, um, Microsoft SQL Server, and I think a couple of others. And I've seen plugins appearing for more than that. Um, if you need no SQL, almost all of them, all of the ones I've seen so far, um, have <coughs> excuse me a different approach to connecting, but it can be done. Uh, one of the things that SQLX does, it's not an ORM, so it's not actually going to handle mappings, but it has a built-in migration system. So as you manage your schema over time, you create migrations. And in this case, I've got a very simple one that I'm just creating a messages table, putting an ID number and a message. I'm adding hello world, hello galaxy, hello universe. Not the most useful application in the world. But now from the command line, I can just run um, and I actually ran these earlier, so but at any time you can run SQLX migrate run, and whatever you have in your migrations folder will be applied, and the table is applied to your data, allowing you to uh, keep track of which migrations you've already run so it won't update data that doesn't need updating. But that's only part of the only part of the magic. Um, the .env file. Normally, uh, you don't want to uh, commit your database secrets to uh, GitHub. Um, that will get you um, unpopular in no time. But so you would set an environment variable database URL. And because I'm on my local computer, I'm just using SQL Lite, and I'm giving you the um, path name on my computer. Um, good luck if you want to try and get into it. Um, but the .env file is a convention in Rust that if you want to set an environment variable and don't want to keep typing that in, uh, you can s add a file to your project.env and just fill it with environment variables that will be set for you when you run the program. And so we've got that table. Let's have a look at the program itself. There's a slight change here that we're still using Takio, still using Axum, still using Sard. But I've imported a little bit from SQLX. And so this line here is the only line that would normally have to change. There's, a, there's an option to just pull it in from the environment variable, like I said. But for clarity, I've just said connect to a local database called HelloDB. And that creates a um, about a five entry uh, connection pool by default. There are a huge number of options you can set to tune the performance for this. Um, I've done with just uh, I've done with just the uh, defaults. Um, the migrations that you saw can also be linked in programmatically. So in this case, my migrations folder is called migrations. I run the migrate macro, and it will automatically connect to my local database, see if the migrations if there are any new migrations that need to be run, and update my database for me on startup. And then just as before, I create a router, I give it a root to hello JSON, and this is new. I add a layer with an extension, um, and extensions are provided by a part of the Axum stack called Hyper. Um, what I'm saying is that I have a resource here called a pool, and you can clone it anytime you want, and that will give you access to this resource. And I'm a, a handing control of it over to Takio, so this is just like dependency injection on other platforms. and then this part is the same. So um, you'll see I've expanded hello JSON here to support serializing and deserializing, and I've added the ID number. And when we go over to the say hello JSON, the I added a parameter here that matches the extension pool that I set up. And you can do this for any route 
And any um, any research, there's also a state or extension that you can store. And so in this case, whenever this function runs, it will run, um, it will receive from via dependency injection a database pool. And because that pool is set up globally with limits, if you're out of database connections, it's going to make you wait. Um, it handles all of that for you. And one little piece of magic I just wanted to show you. You'll notice I am using a macro here, the exclamation mark, query as, select star from messages. If you use that macro, when you compile your program, um, query the query as macro will actually send submit your query to your database, if it's in your environment, and verify that your SQL is valid. So if I were to mess up the SQL here, or also mess up the types for what I'm receiving, because you'll see I told it I'm, I want to receive this as hello JSON, and it creates a vector of hello JSON. If I were to mess, change these types to one that doesn't match what's in the database, that becomes a compilation error. And so you saved yourself a whole bunch of debugging. Now, what you, when you can't use a query as, is if you want to do something really dangerous that changes state in your live database, um, you don't want that running every time you compile it, but you might you might use query as and then change to the non-macro version once you know that the syntax is correct. But this is actually all you need to connect to the database through the pull, run select star from messages, pretty boring SQL. Uh, the macro automatically receives the rows, and because the row data that's being received aligns perfectly with the structure, maps it for you. So it's not an ORM, but it can do the, it can do read mapping on your behalf. Um, await, it's a green thread, so we're waiting for it to finish. Um, normally, you do some error checking. In this case, I'm just saying crash the program if I got it wrong. Wrap the result in JSON and send it to the browser. So you run when you run this, um, I just showed you that part. Um, so when you run this, you get the nice JSON hello world, hello galaxy, hello universe that we put in the database. And best of all, um, you'll notice I didn't enable optimizations. I didn't um, do any management of memory myself. I didn't turn on thread pulls. I didn't do anything like that. So just in um, 35 lines of code, um, without SQLite, uh, 50 micro, 53 microseconds is all it takes on localhost to um, process the entire uh, the entire um, transaction. Um, SQLite is 90 microseconds, but SQLite is not the fastest database out there. And I also benchmarked just serializing JSON, which came out at 132 nanoseconds, which is uh, really kind of mind-bogglingly fast. Uh, the source code for this um, benchmark is also included in here, HelloDB timed client. And this is also how you go about calling external services. So let's just go through this very quickly. Now, once again, I've created the structure. In this case, I'm going to perform um, 10,000, ah, pardon me, 10,000, slightly more requests that I intended. Um, now, request is pretty much the de facto standard for making HTTP requests out. Highly recommend using it. Um, there is another. There are other ones based on the curl library. This is this one uses native Rust and doesn't require the additional dependencies. And uh, so it's relatively easy to use. You create a client. You tell it that you're going to be sending a GET request to this address. You send it. Await. Unwrap. It has JSON support built in too, also using CERN. Uh, await while it translates the resulting stream into your vector. And if you were to print that out, you'd see the same data that you saw from the web server. Um, now, in the benchmark, I cheated very slightly. I removed the first result. The reason for that is the first time you call request takes quite a bit longer than every other request. Generally speaking, you want to make request once at the beginning and then keep reusing the client. There's a fair amount of tear up logic that slows things down. So you'd be open about the fact that I cheated there. 
For the full course, visit courses.ardenlabs.com.